our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the prophet of Malachi. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, at least in the Protestant Bible, the way that we have laid out the scriptures. They, uh, Ma- Malachi is the last book. And it's a book, and it's placed there intentionally because the last chapters of Malachi talk about the coming Messiah. And they, and they say there's one who's coming before that. And so it's a great way of introducing John the Baptist. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, today in the message. But we're going to be reading from Malachi chapter 2, starting with verse 17. Malachi was writing or prophesying, if you will. He was prophesying during a time in Israel's history of rebuilding. It was a time when the Persians had allowed the Israelites to go back into the, the promised land, and they had started the building process of rebuilding the walls. If you remember the story of Nehemiah, it's around that same time that Malachi is prophesying. And so he's trying to speak a word of hope in a reality that, that is very dark. And, but also, in, in, in light of speaking a word of hope, he also has to speak a word of judgment. Because sometimes we have to own our brokenness. We have to own our sin before we can find redemption through those, in, in, within light of those sins. And so that's the word of Malachi. So Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, starts out with the, the prophet speaking to the people. And he says, you know, you have wor- wearied the Lord with your words. And you say, well, how have we wearied him? By saying, the prophet says, all who do evil are good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? So basically what they're saying, he's saying there is that, you know, you're looking at the destruction, you're looking at all of the brokenness that exists around you, and you're saying, is, is evil being rewarded? Is, is the good not being rewarded? Is good not being blessed, but the evil is being blessed? What's going on here? And where is the God of justice? In this time, where is God in this place and at this time? The Lord speaks in verse 1. And the Lord says, See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messengers of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness." Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words on our lips be pleasing unto you. May the meditations of our heart be pleasing unto you. May we allow space for your Holy Spirit to speak and to change us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. You have to wash your hands before you can hold my baby brother, the little five-year-old girl said, standing at the door of the hospital when I went in to visit this brand new baby brother that had just been born. She was the self-appointed messenger of clean hands for anybody that showed up to visit her mama and her new baby brother that day in the hospital. So anyone who came in would be greeted by this little five-year-old girl who said, you must wash your hands before you hold my baby brother. Now, who likes to be told to wash their hands. Who, who likes to be told they have dirty hands, especially by a five-year-old little child? Who likes to be told they're not clean? You know, as kids, we despise taking a bath. Y'all kind of wiggle your way out of taking baths, right? You just find a way not to take a bath? No? No? Okay. Well, you're, you're just cool kids then. So, my yeah, mine's almost 16, and I feel like he still does. But... So, but then as adults, we still don't like to have our dirt exposed, do we? 
And here's the thing. I don't think God is as concerned about dirt on the hands, unless it's flu season and, and, you know, this season. I don't think God is concerned about dirt on the hands as God is with dirt on the heart. There's a story in the New Testament about Jesus being invited over to dinner with some religious leaders. And apparently, for some reason, we're not really sure why, but Jesus chose not to wash his hands before he sat down at the table. It's kind of gross, to be quite honest with you, but for some reason, he chose not to wash his hands, and he sat down at the table to eat. The religious leaders that were sitting there at the table with Jesus, they picked up on the fact that Jesus refused to wash his hands, and they were disgusted. Well, Jesus picks up the fact that they were disgusted. And he turns to one of the Pharisees, the one who had invited him, his host, and he says, Now you Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are still full of greed and wickedness. Now this is the same judgment that the prophets had on the people of Israel. Greed, idolatry, how they treated the poor, how they looked upon their neighbor. All of that is what brought down God's judgment on God's people. God spoke through one particular prophet, and a prophet by the name of Micah. And the question was asked, well, Lord, what shall we bring before you? What can please you? What is it that we can do in our worship experience that would be pleasing to you? Can we bring you the biggest of burnt offerings? Can we bring you a thousand rams to be sacrificed? And God says, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? You see, God is interested in what it is that keeps the heart pure. How we treat the poor is a heart issue. How we act toward our neighbors is a heart issue. How we treat those that are differently than us is a heart issue. And God is interested in those things. But if we're honest this morning, if we could just be honest, most of us have learned how to live with the dirt. We've learned how to live with ignoring the poor. We've learned how to live with neglecting the needs of our neighbor. And because we got a good reason. We're busy. We have limited resources, or we're too old, or we're too young. We have enough on our plate. We can't possibly add anything else to our life, especially someone who may be in a place of need. You know what I think one of the greatest modern inventions is? Noise-canceling headphones. I mean, I'm telling you, those things are great because I don't care. You know, you could be in the busy coffee shop, put those things on, and you focus. Better yet, you can be at home in your recliner and put those things on, and you don't, unless, you know, your wife comes around and happens to have a rolled-up newspaper and reminds you that, you know, you're part of that family also. But you can put those things on, and you can cancel out all the noise around you. And all you can can focus on is what is right there in front of you. And I think that's how many of us have chosen to live our lives. We've chosen to ignore the the cry of the needy. We've chosen to to neglect the, the, the pain of the hurting. And I get it. It can be overwhelming. The cries of a million neglected children worldwide, that's a loud cry. The cry of the lonely, particularly in the season of Christmas, that's a piercing cry. The cries of starvation across the globe, that's a heartbreaking cry. And we have to shut down, put on our headphones. And we do it, and, and, and we do it because we think, you know, i got to self-care. i got to take care of myself because if I don't, I'm, I'm fearful that I'll go to a place of despair. 
So here's where we have. We have found ourselves in the same place that the people of Malachi's day found themselves. We have wearied the, wor- the, the Lord with our words. We've questioned God's justice. We wonder, hey, is evil, is evil being rewarded? Is good not being considered? And then the prophet comes along and he says, you know what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you a messenger. And I'm going to send you a messenger to prepare the way for my coming. So let's fast forward real quick. Let's fast forward 500, 600 years to John the Baptist. John the Baptist shows up on the scene and he's preaching a message of judgment to those who have dirty hearts. And John tells the people that are going out to him, he's saying you got to repent and you got to demonstrate fruits that are worthy of repentance. Repentance is a, is a big religious word. It really just means the, the change your ways. You're going in one direction, and repent says, no, I'm going to go in another direction. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to go in another direction. And that's what John the Baptist is telling the folks. So they're all thinking, oh, okay, what do we got to do then, John? What do you need us to do? How do you need us to do that? Do we need, how many rams do I bring to the sacrifice? How many, you know, how big of a bonfire of, 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 of worship do I offer to God? And John says, no, that's, that's not it. You got two jackets in your closet? Give one of them away. You got more food on your table than you could eat? How about sharing some of that? Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. You see, the messenger sent to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah is telling us that that if we're going to prepare for Christmas, then we've got to be paying attention to the cries around us. We must not neglect the neglected. We must look after the unseen. We must care for the uncared. The messenger carries this message of hope that no one is forgotten. And that is the message of Christmas. God with us, Emmanuel, God with us. There is no one that has been forgotten. And our call as followers of this God is to remind the world that you're not forgotten, that your cries are not going ignored. For those of us who are tempted to forget the forgotten, that can really be a harsh message. But maybe, maybe that's what's needed to get our attention. Maybe we need that little five-year-old girl standing at the door telling those of us who are trying to come in and admire the baby, do you have, is your hands clean? Do you have clean hands? You see, that's the message of Advent. That's the reason Advent exists. It's the season of preparation. It's the season when the refiner fire is lit and the soap is laid out. And it's the season of refining before we can hold the baby. It's the season of getting rid of of anything that would prevent us from standing in awe before the manger. In Flannery O'Connor's short story, Revelation, the main character is Miss Ruby Turpin. Now, Ruby Turpin is the domineering spouse of a pig farmer. She's also a racist. And she's a racist who took, who took a virtue in categorizing people. Black, white, poor, rich. She considered her racism or classism a high virtue of someone of her stature. One day... While sitting in the waiting room of her doctor's office, expressing gratitude to herself that she is not like that poor white person or that black person, Miss Turpin is assaulted. 
She's assaulted by a young teenage girl who gets up from her seat and takes a textbook that she had been reading and smacks Miss Turpin right upside down. So she doesn't just see this as an act from... Is it as a, as a messenger from God? So when Ruby Turpin arrived home from the doctor's office, with this huge knot on her forehead, she stomps out to, 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 to her shed and she picks up her hose and, and she begins to wash down her pigs with a forceful stream of cold water. And she's angry. She's angry at God. And so as soon as her husband is out of earshot, Ruby looks to the heavens and she begins to growl before God. And she says, why did you send me a message like that for? How am I a warthog and a child of God at the same time? How am I saved and from hell at the same time? At the close of O'Connor's short story, Miss Turpin has a vision, a revelation. She has it as she's standing outside by her pigs. And she sees a ladder on which people are ascending into heaven. And they're ascending into heaven. They're walking in the very groups that she has spent her life categorizing everyone in. The poor, the rich, the white, the black. And then there was her. And people like her. Who were just standing. And going last. You see, sometimes... Sometimes God's message can seem like a knock upside the head. Sometimes they are so in your face that it will cause you to look at the world differently. Sometimes they're so harsh that all you can do is weep. Here's what I want to invite you to do over the next few weeks as you get closer and closer to Christmas. I want you to pay attention to those moments when your heart is pierced. I want you to pay attention to those moments when when a situation or circumstance or a word spoken to you has the, the ability to turn your world upside down. And I don't want you to disrupt. I don't want you to ignore that. I don't want you to turn your back to that. I don't want you to walk away from that. I want you to acknowledge that. And don't ignore those disruptions. Because those disruptions could be the messengers of hope that are showing you the way to the manger. You think you know the way to the manger. It's through more gifts or more activities or more events. But maybe this messenger of hope wants to show you another way. Why does God do this? You've had that happen, right? You've you've been you know you, you know you just it's so dramatic, it's so so in your face, so forceful, and you're like, ah, I don't know how to handle that. Why does God sometimes get our attention like that? I, I think one of the clues comes from O'Connor's story. The name of that teenage girl who hit her upside the head in that doctor's office. That girl's name is Grace. That's why God does it. You see, sometimes Grace feels like a painful hit upside the head. But it might be the grace that gets us back on the road of redemption. Let us pray. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers today. We give you thanks that you are God with us. That you are a God who has not forgotten us, even when we have forgotten you. Forgive us for ignoring the cries of the needy, 
Forgive us for turning a blind eye to the broken. Forgive us for being a disobedient church. And send forth your Holy Spirit, your messenger of grace, to renew our hearts, to transform us, to make us into the people you have called us to be. Set us back on the road of redemption as we inch ever closer to that moment, to that scene of new life. It's in your name we pray.